Now here in the West, Buddhism is, Buddhism is often thought of as the most peaceful and passive of all religions. But in Burma, Buddhist extremism against the country's Muslim minority has led to hundreds of deaths and has caused thousands to flee their homes. So how do you get from Zen to murder? Well, joining us in the Google Hangout, we have Lama Surya Das, a Buddhist author, Mark Juergensmeyer, a scholar of religious violence and director of the Orfala Center for Global and International Studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara, Michael Jerison, he is Assistant Professor of Religious Studies at Youngstown State University. And we will have joining us soon Barbara Crossett, who is a journalist uh, who covers Southeast Asia and South Asia and recently spent time in Burma. So, Michael, I want to go to you first. You've spent time with Buddhist monks in Thailand. Um, where, where has, you know, what, what, what's sprung up the religious violence there? Because I'm here, it's been occurring there as well. Well, what's happened is since 2004, there's been a rise in, I guess, uh, and violence in the South, in which people have tried to separate from, from the Thai state. And what you've seen in the last eight, nine years is the state co-opting Buddhist temples as military compounds. Uh, you see the army of what's called military monks, mon uh, monks who are also simultaneously soldiers, uh, and it's all clandestine with the state, as well as now um, these Buddhist militias that are out to try to stop and fight back against the Malay Muslim insurgents. And so it's been not primarily a religious conflict, but religion has certainly become a large part of it. Right. It's that, it seems to be a mix of religion and nationalism that leads to uh, the religious come nationalist violence you're seeing in Southeast Asia. Well, that's yeah, very much the case. Uh, in, in Thailand, most times will say to be Thai is to be Buddhist. Uh, so you use it. And in that same sense, uh, whenever you see the state present in the South, they see it simultaneously that to be present there, you need to have the monks there as well. And so this is why the, many of the monks are protected on morning alms and why there's a lot of soldiers stationed at the monasteries. And, uh, and, and Lama, you know, when, when you hear about uh, violence emerging out of, uh, out of Buddhists in really the area where, you know, Buddhism is most prevalent. You know, as, as a Western practicing Buddhist, what, what, do you, what do you think about that? Well, that's of course a big question. Um, first of all, this is not entirely new in the world. There was a lot of violence in the Buddhist country of Sri Lanka in recent decades. And in Tibet, there's been 200 almost self-immolating monks protesting Chinese communists conquering Tibet. And the Japanese Zen masters were quite vehement and even violence advocating in World War II against the Chinese. So this is not new in history. And Buddhism is not so much a passive religion, as you said, Mike, but a pacifist, which is a peace-loving religion. It's actually very dynamic, not passive. And some groups are quite socially activist, it's certainly in the Buddhist countries, where there's all kinds of monks and nuns, not just reclusive, meditator or scholar monks and nuns, but social activists doing all kinds of good works, hopefully good works in the world. Of course, the Dalai Lama and most of us think that it's unthinkable that monks or nuns or even Buddhists would pick up guns and swords, knives and clubs and be uh, beating or harming people or any beings yeah. or and indulging in inter-religious warfare, but this has happened before in the world, so it's very unfortunate that it's happening now, but uh, maybe it's also something we need to understand that where there's power and big institutions mixed with government and the status quo, then these things happen. Corruption happens. Yeah, and Barbara, take us into Burma and its current situation right now, because in my, in my uh, understanding, I remember the 2007 protests against the dictatorship in Burma, and I remember seeing the monks leading the charge in the protests, the ones who were really uh, making the most out of the demonstrations on the streets and, pa and peaceful demonstrations on the streets there. Uh, and, you know, of course, as, as Lama Surya said, in, uh, over history, you've seen in Southeast Asia and East Asia self immolations of monks to protest wars going on in their own countries. So uh, how, does it, how does it get from what we saw, especially in 2007 with, with the monks in Burma, uh, to where the country and where the, these particular more extremist monks uh, are right now? Well, in <clears throat> 2007 and even before, as you know, um, the monks, monks really 
were martyrs for democracy when called upon, and they did some extremely brave things up in Mandalay, uh, down in, in Rangoon, and th throughout a couple of decades. But 2007 was really the one that got the most international attention. So the monks have a huge amount of credibility and regard uh, on the part of the, of the Burmese people, and, um, and that plays in their favor. Now, what's happened since 2007 and 2010 and 11 and into 2012, the, the, the state relaxed a lot of its restrictions on public protest and so on, and this gave some space for the more nationalistic monks uh, to get out into the open. And I should add now, there are some people who believe that this isn't just these particular nationalistic monks, particularly uh, one in, in, uh, in, who is a leader of the 969 movement, which we can talk about later. Um, <clears throat> it may be, there may be some shadowy figures behind this that want to see democracy di disrupted. So it's a very complicated situation. Uh, the Burmese monks have, you know, are hugely uh, respected, uh, but now they have uh, the, you know, the ability to fissure if this is all it is, and into some more nationalistic groups who feel that the Burmese nation can be Burmese only if it's also Buddhist, mm -hmm. and then and then the uh, you know the, uh, the vast majority of monks who probably are continuing to tend to the population as they always have in the villages and towns. So please do tell me about the 969 movement. How does it differ from, if it is, if there is, you know, mainstream Buddhism uh, and the Buddhism we know here in the West or what we hear about, you know, in, in Japan and other places in East Asia? Well, I, um, I, as, as again, the people on this panel know even better than I ever would, um, there, there are many schools and well not many but three or four major schools of buddhism and uh or doctrinal divisions or whatever you want it's not sects in this in the sense that we talked about about sects uh, as that's s e c t s in christianity or any other religion it's a uh, these are divisions and so uh so so you can't talk about all buddhists i mean the zen buddhists of japan are different uh, from the Theravada Buddhists in um, Sri Lanka, as the Lama was saying, and in, in Thailand and in, um, in, now in Burma. Uh, that doesn't mean that some are more nationalistic or militaristic than others. It just means that these are different groups of Buddhists. So, so it's, and Tibetan Buddhists, of course, an entirely different story. Uh, best known among them, of course, the Dalai Lama and now the Karmapa. But um, so, so it's, it's hard to generalize about this. I, in the case of Burma, I feel very strongly that it's an opening to all kinds of opinion. It's, uh, it's an unwillingness of Aung San Suu Kyi, who has the, the most respect in the country of anybody, to come down hard on this, this Buddhist violence. Mm -hmm. She has to keep the support of the military on one hand and the Buddhist uh, majority on the other hand because she wants to run for president in 2015. It sounds cynical to say she's playing politics because it's really not her character, but there is an element of this. Mm -hmm. And so there is no one taking moral leadership. The president hasn't done it. Uh, he's again a Burmese Buddhist general. The entire military is Burmese Buddhist. And it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an issue that people tell me when I was last there, and that was in the fall, uh, has been simmering really since independence, uh, the hostility to the Muslims, uh, wh who many people see as imports by the British colonial powers, okay. as so often the case in so many of these horrible situations, it goes way back into history. Well, so, Mark, let's talk a little bit more about that history as well. Um, I do want to learn a bit more about the 969 movement as it's, as it's manifesting itself in Burma now, but please put that in its context as well. Well, there are different groups of Muslims in, in Burma that have been under siege. Uh, there have been tribal communities in northern part of Burma that have been traditionally a kind of uh, uh, difficult to assimilate into the larger Burmese population. But there's also, as Barbara mentioned, a large number of uh, Bangladeshi immigrants that now concern a lot of Burmese. Is Burma going to be swamped by Bangladeshi immigrants, you get a kind of phenomenon as we have in Southern California, fear of Mexican immigrants coming and, you know, swamping the population. Uh, so it's understandable that there would be a kind of oh, uh, uncomfortableness about some of these Muslim minorities, but the stridency of this new movement is really quite remarkable. And part of, of course, is the kind of grandstanding of some of these Muslim, I mean, these Buddhist revivalists. Seize on the re uh, 
relaxation regulations in Burma to become kind of popularist leaders. But I think it's also part of a global phenomenon is we live in an era in which secular nationalism is really under siege, a global era where religion and ethnicity have often risen to try to claim a sense of nationalism in an era where people feel insecure by forces of globalization. And, and Mark, yeah. Mark, let me let me actually ask you on this. But before I move the, move on, if you could turn down your speakers a bit, we're getting a bit of an echo as uh, as as you're talking. So as soon as I finish this question, so you can hear my question, please do turn down the speakers a bit before you before you talk. Um, let me ask you about about. Uh, so you're putting on earphones, maybe? Cool. Okay. Yeah, Excellent. <laughs> so, so Mark, let, let me ask you: uh, When it comes to uh, Buddhism as Buddhism, you know, is there anything that the um, oh, I see you're plugging in your, your headphones. I hope you can still hear me, though. Uh, and if he's not up by the time I ask this question, someone else can answer. Okay, there you are. You guys are missing a great show here. It's pretty awesome. What's going on in the hangout right now? All right. So, right. so, so, Mark. Now that I've okay, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can. Excellent. Hear you. Okay, okay. My uh, my my filibustering is over. I'm going to put the question to you directly. Uh, is there anything about Buddhism itself that the 969 movement or the the uh, the Buddhists who are practicing and preaching violence call upon to justify their violence? Yes and no. I mean, every religious tradition has the potential to be politicized, so there's nothing peculiar about Buddhism in that sense. On the other hand, Theravada Buddhism, as opposed to Mahayana Buddhism, has been associated with statecraft traditionally in a way that makes it more able to be politicized. The same is true of Tibetan Buddhism. It is possible for Tibetan Buddhism to be politicized in the same way. Yeah, uh, and, and this is something that in our comments section people are going back and forth on, and this goes towards any world religion here. Uh, Yoga for World Peace writes, uh, I think it's naive for people to think that any religion is peaceful. Islam, Christianity, Judaism, etc. Name it and you'll find a history of violence. Now, is that history of violence, again, is it tied to religious teachings, or is it tied to when the religion meets majoritarian or nationalistic impulses? Um, and and uh, let me, uh, yeah, please actually go, go ahead with that, Mark. This is a question directed to me. Sure. Yeah. No. I. You know. The as I say, that religious teachings can be exploited. We've been in the habit of kind of uh, dissing Islam uh, for having a, a tradition of politicized religion. But every religious tradition has this history. Even Hinduism, Buddhism, Sikhism. I mean, it's remarkable in, in recent years the way in which in Sri Lanka, Buddhism has uh, risen not only in opposition to the Tamil separatist movement in the north, but also against the government. Uh, and when you think of Buddhism as the most peaceful religious tradition, uh, in Bhutan a couple of years ago, it's a wonderful Tibetan community, and yet uh, they had no problem whatsoever of reading the country of a, of a fifth of the population, 200,000 these Hindus, because they weren't a part of the ethnic purity of Bhutan. And these poor people are still kind of struggling to find a home. In, well, that's not a direct physical violence, but it is a very violent disruption of the culture. So when religion becomes a part of the political culture, as it does in almost every part of the planet, particularly in an era of globalization, where there's an effort to try to claim, reclaim uh, nationalist identities through ethnicity and religion, then it has the potential of being very violent indeed. Hmm. And, and Lama, when it comes to Islam or Christianity or other religions that are more often associated with sectarian violence or majoritarian violence or nationalistic violence, uh, we often hear about a conversation going on within uh, the religion and without the religion uh, over what to do about that violence. Is there that kind of conversation going on uh, among the Buddhist community? Yes, there definitely seems to be. And um, even in Burma, I heard that 200 or 300 leading uh, abbots or monks or whatever they are are going to meet on Thursday to talk about this specific situation that's going on right now in Myanmar and Burma. But more generally, this has been going on in the Buddhist community. And of course, the Dalai Lama has joined with, and the Karmapa and other head lamas of Tibetan Buddhism have joined with the Nobel Peace Laureates and others this week in denouncing the violence. And uh, I think everyone wants people to understand that it's not the basic tenets of the religion that are preaching the violence, but 
as the professor and other people were saying, the politicization, the association with the status quo, the jingoism and xenophobia of ultranationalists, and so forth. So it's political, just like mm. everybody knows that Jesus' message was mainly one of love and compassion, but there were crusades and holy wars. Yeah. And even the concept of righteous war has been discussed in the religious community in the last 50 or 100 years quite a bit by Christian theologians and all a righteous war, such as, for example, it might be used as an example to take arms against a threat like Hitler taking over the world. So, um, I, but I do want to just make one point to push the conversation perhaps to another level. Also to say, just for us to continue moving forward in these years, uh, thinking together and working on these problems, uh, Mike, that People tell me things like Buddhism is growing, which it isn't. It's dying in the world. It was decimated by communism in, in Asia and so on. But um, the fastest growing religions, religion in the world is Islam, but that's not my point. The fastest growing religions are the ultra-conservative, right-wing, most dogmatic ones. And that seems to me, and other commentators, I'm not alone in this, because what's happening is people are very insecure and anxious in this age of great fast change huh. and uh, exponential change, not just incremental and, change, and, and therefore reaching back for security, for example, to the ancient ways of Sharia and Islam, or uh, very conservative Christianity and Christianity and so on. Yeah. So in fact, this conservative religion or, or most dogmatic religion, which has its extreme of the violent religionists who are terrorists in the world, religious terrorists, but this at, is something we have to deal with today. That's the kind of religion that's growing at its, across at its, the board. And it's most dogmatic, though. Is, is Buddhism that way as well? Um, I hate to say yes to such a question. I'm going to take the fifth on that. Oh, well then. But maybe. Yeah, go ahead, Michael. Maybe. I'm afraid. Uh, I, I would not take the fifth on that. Um, I would differ slightly from Lama Suryadas in that you're going to find extremism and dogmatism in any religion. Uh, and you have found it in Buddhism, not just in the last 100 or 200 years, but in the last 1,500, 1,800 years. Um, and the issue that we see today is that uh, a lot of the violence is about identity and claiming identity. What links up right now, for example, Sri Lanka with the Badubala Sena, who are right now attacking Muslims after, you know, in, in Sri Lanka, and we see with Burma right now with the Rohingya, and in Thailand, where the, the Buddhists in Thailand are saying that they want to get rid of the Muslims because they fear them. It's about trying to feel like, it's a sense of feeling like their homeland is under attack. Okay, and with that, I want to put to you a question from one of our commenters, DNL10, uh, saying, does the panel think this uptick in violence began as a pushback against Muslim fundamentalism. Uh, Michael? No, I don't. I think that Mus the, I think the current, and Mark was talking about this too, the globalization today and the rise of Islamophobia has certainly, I think, inflamed uh, fears. But I think what we see in each case with uh, Burma, Sri Lanka, Thailand, for example, these countries, it's particular historical instances like the Thai state weakening and the southern uh, provinces weren't trying to separate again, or as was mentioned before by Barbara, how you have the coming of democracy in Burma, which is allowing for this to happen, or with the 26-year civil war in Sri Lanka coming to an end, the decimation of the LTTE, which were the Tamil uh, Tigers, and now the pushing to try to limit the next minority, which are the Muslims. I don't think the the impetus is Muslim fundamentalism, but I think that certainly helps to fan the flames of wanting to take care of Muslims. Mm -hmm. That. That's, that's a very good point because, in fact, in some cases, it's the opposite of Islamic fundamentalism. I've heard people in the UN who were in Burma throughout this last, oh, you know, both ever since a few decades back, that 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 what's happening to the Rohingyas could, in fact, promote or, or tempt a fundamentalist, not not fundamentalist, militants is a better word, from co to come in to the region and to 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 make hay with this unrest and with this persecution of Muslims. So, you know, I like to think that part of this, it is identity, but I would go back a stage at the end of anti-colonialism. There were all kinds of grudges, um, and, and everybody knows this in these Buddhist countries. The Sinhalese, who are Buddhist largely, although there are plenty of Christians and others among them, um, always felt the Tamils were given special treatment by the British, that they were given, you know, sort of privileges and they were better educated and all that stuff. You know, the same thing, wherever there's been, for particularly a military, ruler, military uh, dictatorship of any kind, just a junta, whatever, um, when that ends, 
um, the people, uh, you know, sort of want to do the absolute opposite of whatever it was it, they had before. I think Poland is a good example. It's but, way out uh, of our territory. Barbara, in, in my understanding, the junta in uh, Burma was also Buddhist, and it, so this seems to be more of a majoritarian nationalism as opposed to some sort of uh, uh, score settling or resentment. Well, yeah, they were Buddhist, but I mean, they ran a military dictatorship, and um, you know, the, 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 a lot of monks were frightened. All, all of us who were there in the 1980s and in the 90s, I was banned twice after that, and I didn't go back till late last year. Um, is that is that there were plenty of frightened monks all the way along, and they knew that if they crossed the line into politics, even though they may have been, they saw the suffering in the villages, they saw the education system collapse, they saw the health system disappear, and they were they were Democrats at heart, or even revolutionaries in their in their minds, but but they were afraid. I mean, these people were generals first and Buddhists second. They yeah. may have been superstitious. Uh, they build themselves pagodas, you know, so the afterlife can take care of itself and all that. But but it's different. And I think you know, look what happened in Egypt when people when 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 the the clamps come off. A lot of people do seek identity, and as, in, as in I was going to say in Poland, anything that wasn't communist sent people flocking to the Catholic Church, which was very conservative. And so, you know, it, 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 it is identity, but I think it's also, it, it, it brews up over a period of time, and then it boils over. Now, are the monks who were the face of the protest movement in 2007 of the same ilk, uh, the, sa uh, the same monks who are leading the violence going on now? I don't think so. Somebody who's, who knows this better than I do. I don't. Yeah. I, this 41-year-old monk, uh, um, who's uh, Uwitaru, uh, sorry, Uwitaru, who is leading the 969 movement, which I never did answer your question. He calls it the 969 campaign. Uh, I, I think there's some question about again, where is this, where is this being funded? It is, it is red hot on the social networks, and there were uh, uh, very thoughtful Burmese who thought that when the president was here uh, for uh, an official visit, he should never have thought about even going on a, a social media network and trying to talk to the Burmese because this opens the door to this, and it's apparently quite bad uh, within Burma. And I think they've asked Facebook to tone it down. I don't, I don't know where that stands now because I haven't been there for a while. Barbara Uwitsu was convicted for violence uh, five or ten years ago and did five years in prison for that. So he has been involved in these um, extreme acts and incitements before. But uh, as you say, it may be being incited by all kinds of shadowy figures, not just Buddhist, uh, for Buddhist purposes. Um, also, I want to make the point that um, during the Saffron Revolution in 2007, led by monks, that was very uh, explicitly a peaceful Mm -hmm. Revolution, and um, although there was some violence, it was mostly retaliatory by the military junta. And this is not a peaceful uh, movement that right. we're dealing with right yeah, now. I mean, hence, hence my question then of how to connect those two, if they are connectable at all, between what's going on now no, and no, what happened in 2007. Yeah, Michael. Well, this I was mean, Mark. Oh, Mark, Mark. Sorry, let, let me let me have Mark yeah, go ahead. I, Sorry, Michael. Yeah, I don't I don't think there is a connection. The Sashin Wiratu is really a different animal than the 2007 monks, and he's really kind of a grandstander, a popularizer, a kind of in some ways you know a Burmese televangelist, and in, in, in trying to create. I think part of this is a personal agenda to try to create a <clears throat> political clout and the following uh, by stirring up these passions, but the passions are real. And I think Barbara Cosette made a very interesting and good point that there's a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy about talking about Muslim fundamentalists or Muslim extremists, because that 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 language, even though it's not true, it may not be true uh, that a particular group is an extremist. They just may be ordinarily ordinary Muslims, but by branding them that way. Uh, you, you raise the passions against them, but then in response mm. creates a defensiveness which is extreme. So in a funny kind of way, it creates Muslim extremism by being extreme on the Buddhist side or any other side that tries to reject uh, Islam through this kind of Islamophobia. Yeah. And Michael, I'm sorry I cut you off before, but you had something to say? No, I, I agree with what Mark just said. And I would say that with the Saffron Revolution and what we're seeing now with Rohingya, or you could say the Saffron Army in Sri Lanka, it shows the, the ambivalence within Buddhist traditions, which you would see in all religions, that the, where Buddhism can be used for peacemaking, uh, for civil disobedience, but it can also be used for violence. You would ask before about, you know, how are there precepts, are there teachings in Buddhism that could allow for this? One of the things that you see early on in the text in Buddhism is the ambiguity when it comes to the state. 
mm-hmm. and how oftentimes violence is contingent upon one's intention of being good or bad. And you know, this allows you know what for I, the slippage. Yeah, Barbara. When I, po- no, when I posed no, this question to a Buddhist monk in, uh, in Sri Lanka about how, how they could possibly justify violence from a Buddhist perspective, I said, don't Buddhists believe in nonviolence? He said, oh, yes. He said, we, we Buddhists believe in nonviolence, absolutely. But then he said, you know, we also believe in karma. And karma means that you get what you deserve. And huh. some of these bastards, he says, get what they deserve a lot more quickly because they're evil people. So he was very quick to justify the other side. And karma, in my understanding, from a Western non-Buddhist, is what goes around comes around and usually happening by, you know, not by a human's hand. You know, it's somehow the universe working in these ways. But this was a vision of karma that was completely the opposite. Yeah. <laughs> well. And, yeah, and can I just say that I, I think if we have time, the one question that's missing from this uh, in, in, in every conversation almost really, and because people don't want to uh, focus on Aung San Suu Kyi too much, is the moral leadership. Um, and where is it in Burma right now that can step in? I mean, it's thin ice to compare anything the Dalai Lama does because he's an international institution. But, but it, you know, he has tried to keep down um, uh, hotheads among young, some of the Tibetan youth for, for, for decades and so on and, and, and does continue to talk about peace. Now, he, he has made some comments, but, but within Burma, the president is not strong enough. And Aung San Suu Kyi, as I said, is... Uh, is unwilling for political reasons to, uh, you know, to, to, to get too far involved in this. And also she's a Burmese Buddhist and also the daughter of a general who founded the army. And she wants to be president. So, you know, I, that's, that's what a lot of people feel is the missing piece of this. Hmm. Barbara, do you think if and when she gets elected, she would be able to take more of a moral leadership stance on such things? Oh, it's a long way away, 2015. She's barred by, for even standing for office by the Constitution, so there are a lot of big steps that have to be, uh, that have to be uh, taken. And um, uh, it, it's hard to tell. I mean, can, can it go on that long without you know, either bringing in military intervention or, or just chasing away investors, except huh. for the Chinese, the Thais, and maybe a few others who aren't going to be too bothered by this? But... Um, you know, American sanctions are still on Burma. They're only waived, not lifted. And, and so, so it could, a hell of a lot of damage could be done to the country. I think that's what I'm saying we'll be yes. before we get to 2015. Well, we're worried that the military junta would reassert its power upon being challenged. That's one. So push Burma back towards, let's call it the dark, rather than forward towards the, the future, let's say. And even so, I want to put this to, to Mark or Michael, do denunciations from Dalai Lama, from other parts of the Buddhist community, from other le- Buddhist leaders, do those denunciations carry any weight with the, the, the violence going on and those who are committing the violence? Well, not, not as much weight as, as would voices within Burma. And I think Baba Krasad is quite right. Aung San Suu Kyi has an opportunity here to exert moral leadership. But so do the liberal monks. Here are, maybe hmm. liberal is not the right word, but those monks that were part of the 2007 uh, demonstrations in, in Burma those monks that do believe in democracy, I would think that they would feel insulted and deeply uh, hurt by this kind of uh, corruption of the democratic spirit in, in Burma right now. And it's being it's exploitation uh, by radical, uh, bad, radical Buddhist monks. I think they're the ones who really have the opportunity to step in and say, look, as B- Burmese Buddhists, we think this is inappropriate and we need to stand up against it. Do you think, they're, do you think they are? You know, sometimes I wonder, because I'm not there, uh, whether they are trying and whether that's not getting out or around or is not so well known. Because, you know, in a way, everyone now, I don't want to say picking on Burma, but, but th- this is now in focus, uh, even more in focus than, you know, the, some of the things that happened in Sri Lanka. Um, it'd be before even the end of the Tamil Rebellion and, you know, in the hills when there was a nationalistic, basically, a Buddhist group, you know, they were killing people right and left. Um, you know, that it's, 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 a, you know, in, in India, I was just looking today, the, the number of people killed in Burma may be in the hundreds. Um, at least that's what the Irrawaddy was saying, and I don't know how up-to-date that is. In, in India, I mean, at least 1,000, maybe up to 2,000 Muslims were butchered in Gujarat in 2002. Mm. We don't apply the same. The human rights groups do. Even the State Department's human rights report does. But we don't apply the same, you know, sort of uh, intense 
focus and criticism that is now being applied to the Burmese monks. This doesn't excuse them, but it also takes them out of the realm of relativity in that part of the world. The, the Hindu record against the Sikhs, against the Muslims, against Christians in some areas is much, much worse. Mm-hmm. But it's a democracy, and the institutions theoretically work. Well, Lama Surya, Mark, you're absolutely Mark, right. It's and, your numbers. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's true. Yeah, sorry, sorry, Mark. Um, but I, I wanted to thank you guys for this conversation. Uh, it's something that I haven't seen anywhere else, so I'm glad you guys joined us right here on HuffPost Live. So, Lama Surya, Mark, Michael, and Barbara, thank you very much. And thank everyone you. watching, please do keep watching us here at HuffPost Live.